وَقَالَ فِيهِ أَيْ فِي نُكَتِهِ أَيْضَى And he, Abu Zura, also said therein, meaning in his nukat. قَوْلُ الْمِنْهَاجِ وَتُقُبَلُ شَهَادَةٌ بِرِدَّةٍ مُطْلَقًا وَقِيلَ يَجِبُ التَّفْصِيلٌ The wording of the book Al-Minhaj, that's a Nawawi's book Al-Minhaj, is that testimony against someone for committing apostasy is absolutely acceptable. When we say absolutely means not restricted. It doesn't have details like exceptional cases. وَقِيلَ يَجِبُ tafsil, And it was said that it's obligatory to elaborate. وَالْحَاوِي وَيُقُبَلُ مُطْلَقُ شَهَادَةِ الرِّدَّةِ And in the book Al-Hawi, the wording is the unrestricted testimony about someone's apostasy is accepted, is acceptable. فِيهِ umur. There are issues here. أَحَدُهَا قَالَ فِي الْمُهِمَّاتِ One of those issues is that the author of Al-Muhimmat said, Al-Ma'arufu wujubu tafsil. What is known is that it's obligatory to elaborate. Sarlaha bihi al-qaffalu wal-ma'wardi wal-ghazali wa-sahib al-muhadhabi wal-bayan wa-shashi wa-ibn Abi Asrun Al-Qaffal was explicit about that, that there should be detail, elaboration. As well as Al-Mawardi and Al-Ghazali and the authors of Al-Muhadhab and Al-Bayan. The author of Al-Muhadhab, that's Ash-Shirazi. The author of Al-Bayan, that's Al-Imrani. And Ash-Shashi also was explicit about that. And Ibn Abi Asrun also وَهُوَ مُقْتَضَى كَلَامِ الْقَادِ أَبِي الطَّيِّبِ And that's what is dictated by the talk of Judge Abu Tayyib. وَأَجَابَ الرَّافِعِيُّ فِي تَعَارُضِ الْبَيْنَتَيْنِ بِنَحْوِهِ And الرَّافِعِي He answered similar to this concerning two conflicting testimonies. وَيُؤَيِّدُهُ أَنَّ الْأَصَحَ أَنَّ الشَّهَادَةَ عَلَى الْجَرْحِ لَا تُقُبَلُ إِلَّا مُفَثَّرَةً And what supports that? What supports that position that a testimony against apostasy requires elaboration is that when someone testifies about uh, discrediting another with less than blasphemy though, we're talking here, then such a discrediting is not acceptable without being explained. Like when we talk about hadiths, sometimes a narrator is discredited. So discrediting the narrator requires explanation. وَالْإِخْبَارَ بِتَنَجُّسِ الْمَاءِ لَا يُقُبَلُ مِنْ غَيْرِ الْفَقِيهِ الْمُوَافِقِ إِلَّا مَعَ بَيَانِ السَّبَبِ and also, informing someone that some water became contaminated. That's not accepted from a scholar who follows a different school without clarifying the reason for the water being contaminated. And he's giving arguments and comparisons for why a testimony about someone's apostasy should have elaboration. When it came to hadith narrators, uh, for example, discrediting them requires detail, elaboration. When it comes to the example of a scholar who follows a school different from yours telling you that the water, some water is contaminated, then he should clarify what makes it contaminated. So that's a comparison there. وَأَنَّ الْأَكْثَرِينَ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ الشَّهَادَةَ عَلَىٰ الرِّضَاعِ أو عَلَىٰ الرَّضَاعِ 
لا تقبل إلا مع التعرض للشرائط. And most of them, يعني, and also what supports that is that the majorities take the position that testifying about breastfeeding, nursing, because you know if a woman nurses a baby, then if the conditions are fulfilled, that baby becomes her nursing child. Testifying about nursing is not acceptable without addressing the conditions of the nursing. كأن يقول فلان رضاعة من فلانة خمس رضاعات وكان في سن عام أو أقل أو فوق ذلك بلا زيادة على العامين. So, like for example, yeah, we have good understanding here. For example, somebody wants to testify, so he says. So-and-so was nursed by Fulana five times while he was less than two years old, for example. So he testifies like this. He elaborates so that it's clear that this is a valid nursing child. And as Subki also deemed this correct. And Sheikh Burhanuddin Ibn al Firkah also was inclined towards this way. Uh, this one, Ibn al Firkah, uh, Burhanuddin Ibn al Firkah, uh, he's a scholar who's the son of a scholar, Al Firkah. Uh, once when I was in Lebanon, this is just a digression here, it doesn't have anything to do with our lesson, except Al Firkah. When I was in Lebanon, um, I used to always buy books if I found them because they're way cheaper there, way, way, many times cheaper over there. Uh, like a book that you could buy here for like 10 or $15 at the time, you'll get it there for the equivalent of like $3 or $5 or something like that. So once I was in a bookshop or a, a book depot and I saw a book I knew the the, the title al waraqat explanation of al waraqat but the author I didn't know al firqah I looked in the book and I saw that the way it was authored was compliant wasn't like something crazy didn't seem like he's a wahhabi or something so I bought the book so it is it's okay book mashallah it's, I benefited from it so then we had a an assignment to do like a project to do which was to do the biography of any scholar we chose this was uh, part of teaching us how to research and to do takhrij like takhrij means like to produce the the, the references what books and who's who, who is, you know, put them in the footnotes, and then basically, ultimately, to be able to do tahqiq of books, you know, like type up manuscripts and produce them, make them available for the public. Uh, so I chose al Firkah since I bought his book, and I didn't know who he was. And alhamdulillah, I got an A on my bio that I did for al Firkah, mashallah. So this Firkah, the father, uh, and Burhan is Burhanuddin, he's the son. So he says, Wamala ilayhi Sheikh Burhanuddin ibn al Firkah. That's what was the inclination of Sheikh Burhanuddin, the son of Al Firkah. Thaniha qala Shaykhuna al Imam al Bulqini. Now the second case is that our Shaykh Imam al Bulqini said, Mahalu al Khilafi fi shahadati bir riddati anil iman. The difference in opinion, the place of the difference in opinion about testifying about someone's apostasy, apostatizing from faith. Fellow Shahida bi anahur tadda walam yakula anil iman, o kala kafar walam yakula billah. Okay. So he says, Our Shaykh al Bulqini says, the, the, the place of the difference. If you want to zero in on where the difference in opinion is about testifying about someone's ridda, the Arabic word ridda here is important. 
Because ridda has a linguistic meaning. In Arabic, ridda means rujur, to go back or to retract. Allah said about Moses and uh, and Joshua when they were looking for al Khadir. After they went too far, after they went too far, they went back following their own tracks. So the linguistic meaning of ridda is rujur, going back or retracting. And also the original word for Ridda for your information is Irti Dad. Irti Dad. That's the original word. The verb is Irtadda. That's the past tense. Yartaddu. That's present and future tense. So the source of the verb is Irti Dadan. Irti Dad. So that's valid. You can say Irti Dad. Or you can say Ridda. So he says, our Sheikh Al-Imam Al-Bulqini said, the, the place of the difference concerning the testimony about Ridda is if one has to say, Irtadda anil iman, he retracted his faith. He went back on faith. Fellow shahida bi annahu irtadda. So if two witnesses say, Irtadda, he went back. So I'm being literal here so you can understand the point he's trying to make. Walam yakula anil iman. But they didn't say from faith or out of faith. Oh, kala kafar. Walam yakula billah. Or if they said kafara. So also, kafara. What does kufr mean linguistically? Kufr means to cover something. To cover. So a kafir is someone who covers something. So a planter, like a farmer, he's a kafir because he puts the seeds in the ground and covers them with the dirt. So why a, a disbeliever is a kafir? Because he... It's like he conceals the endowment of his Lord. So, if they said, Kafar, he, he did kufr. He covered. If I were to just translate that literally. And they didn't say, about Allah. Yani, they didn't say, Kafara billah, which would then directly mean, he disbelieved in Allah. فَلَا تُقُبَلُ هَذِهِ الشَّهَادَةُ مُطْقَطْعًا Then this testimony is not acceptable absolutely. قَالَ وَقَدْ قَاتَلَ السِّدِّيقُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ أَهْلَ الرِّدَّةِ وَهُمْ ضَرْبَان He said, Al-Bulqini that is, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he fought the people of Ridda. And they are of two types. ضَرْبٌ يَرْتَدُّ عَنِ الْإِيمَانِ وَضَرْبٌ يَرْتَدُّ عَنْ أَدَاءِ الْوَاجِبِ عَلَيْهِمْ One group retracted faith. They went back on faith. And one group, they retracted fulfilling the obligatory right on them. You're familiar with that. He's talking about those who didn't pay zakah. فَأَطْلَقَ النَّاسُ عَلَى الْجَمِيعِ the people called both groups the people of Ridda. So what I'm saying to you now in this paragraph, it's really not going to be appropriate just to translate Ridda as apostasy. Now the word Ridda is being used in a broader sense with dual meaning. It's being used with a dual meaning at the same time. And a Shafi'i documented that in Al Um. And he said, This is Arabic language. 
فَرُدَّتُ لِرْتِدَادُ عَمَّا كَانُوا عَلَيْهِ بِالْكُفْرِ وَلِرْتِدَادُ بِمَنْعِ الْحَقِّ He says, a Shafi'i says, Ridda is irtidad, going back to what they were upon by committing blasphemy. And it is irtidad, going back by withholding an obligatory right. وَمَنْ رَجَعَ عَنْ شَيْءٍ جَازَ أَنْ يُقَالَ رَتَدَّ عَنْ كَذَا And anyone who retracted something or went back on something, it is valid to say. It is valid that it be said. إِرْتَدَّ عَنْ كَذَا He irtadda from that. He went back on that. So that's important. Uh, same thing for the word kufr. Yeah, and usually, it's clear for you, I think. Usually if we said irtadda or ridda means apostasy. Usually when we say kafara or kufr, it means blasphemy. But sometimes you say kafara or yakfur or kufr, it means, or ku it means kufran, it means ungratefulness, not blasphemy. Uh, also understand this, if you understand what we're talking about now, then you can understand those scholars who use the word Al-Qur'an with a double meaning at the same time. And also some other spots. Now, the examples are not coming to me, but even without the examples coming to me, some things have become clear for me that just I can't put my finger on them at the moment. When I come across them, I will recognize them, inshallah. Using one word for double meaning at the same time. Thalithuha, the third issue. Istathna shaykhuna aydan min mahalli al-khilaf ma idha kana shahidani min al-khawarij. Our shaykh also excluded from being subject to difference in opinion for the two witnesses to be from the Khawarij. Alladhina yukafirun yukafiruna birtikabi al-kabair Those who would deem a person a kafir for committing a major sin. فَلَا تُقُبَلُ شَهَادَتَهُمَا إِلَّا بِتَفْصِيلِهَا قَطْعَا Then their testimony will not be accepted except with detail, definitively. Intaha. Why? It's clear because they would deem something that's not kufr as kufr. So if they said he committed apostasy or he committed kufr, then we're not going to rely on that. Yani, someone who in the first place mislabels blasphemy, if he were to testify about something being blasphemy, then you're not going to rely on his testimony. Intaha, end quote. الخارجي يعتبر المعصية الكبيرة كفرا مخرجا من الدين. Sheikh says, the خارجي that's the singular. خوارج is plural. The خارجي considers a major sin blasphemy مخرجا من الدين. Blasphemy that takes one out of the religion. فَلَوْ شَهِدَ الْخَارِجِيُّ الَّذِي لَمْ يَصِلْ إِلَى حَدِّ الْكُفْرِ فِي دَعْوَى عند الحاكم. So had a Khariji who did not reach the level of blasphemy testified about some claim to the judge, the ruler. فَقَالَ فُلَانٌ كَفَرَ بِاللَّهِ And so he said, so and so disbelieved in Allah. لا يقبل كلامه His talk is not acceptable. إلا أن يفسر Unless he explains. لأنه قد يكون كفر الشخص بما ليس كفرا because this one might be deeming a person as a disbeliever for something that's not disbelief. بل لأجل ارتكاب معصية rather it could be just for his committing a sin. 
binaan ala madhabihi based on his way. Wa kathirun minan nasi fi hadha al-asri aydan yakulun fulanun kafara biduni tafsil. And many people at this time, they also say so-and-so committed kufr without any detail. Walau istufsilu la dhakaru shay'an laysa kufra and had they been had detail been sought from them they would have mentioned something that's not blasphemy yani that happens a lot of times when people ask me a question then I, when just by digging a little bit then i would say this is not even kufr فَلِذَلِكَ لَا بُدَّ مِنَ التَّفْصِيلِ So for that reason, getting detail when testifying about someone's apostasy is a requirement. A مِن بَيَانِ مَا يُثْبِتُ الْكُفْرِ The clarification of what confirms blasphemy. And what's like that also? If someone were to go to the caliph and... Uh, turn himself in for a crime that deserves capital punishment. The caliph will make him elaborate so that he doesn't punish him merely for what he thinks, what he might be thinking is something deserving of a capital punishment when it doesn't. Like if he went to the caliph and said, I committed adultery, and then the caliph would tell him, Explain to me. Elaborate. So he might say, well, I kissed her and I touched her and I hugged her. No, that's not adultery. You don't deserve to be executed for this. فَإِنْ قِيلَ أَلَيْسَ قَالَ الْأَوْزَاعِيُّ فِي غَيْلَانِ فِي غَيْلَانَ لِلْخَلِيفَةِ لِلْخَلِيفَةِهِ شَامٍ بَعْدَ مَا نَظَرَهِ And so if it were said, didn't الْأَوْزَاعِي May Allah have mercy on him. The Mujtahid. Say about غَيْلَانِ the destiny denier. To the caliph Hisham, after debating with him, He is a disbeliever, I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, O Prince of Believers. And then Hisham, the caliph, executed him by what Al Auza'i said. فَالْجَوَابُ أَنَّهُ كَانَ مَعْلُومًا عِنْدَ الْأَوْزَاعِي وَعِنْدَ الْخَلِيفَةِ سَبَبُ الْكُفُرِ The answer is that Al-Awza'i and the Caliph both knew the reason for the blasphemy. وَهُوَ عَقِيدَةُ الْإِعْتِزَالِ Which was the belief of the Mu'tazila, destiny denial. Although the first Mu'tazili was Wasil, this one, Ghailan, is before Wasil. But they said, Irtizal, they meant here destiny denial. Irtizal, the, the way of the Mu'tazila, encompasses more than destiny denial. Like believing in a limbo status between faith and blasphemy. And other things, denying the attributes of Allah and denying the special merits of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and other things. Faida benefit. Al waladu ladi huwa dun al buluri in hasala minhu firlun kufriyun awirti kadun kufriyun o kaulun kufri. A child below puberty, if there occurred from him a blasphemous action, or a blasphemous conviction or a blasphemous word. And then what is correct was clarified for him. And then he believed what was correct. And he reached puberty with a correct conviction. Then this child who reached puberty believing what's correct he is a Muslim even if he didn't say the shahada from that blasphemy that came from him before puberty. This is the meaning what, of what the jurist said 
the apostasy of a child is invalid. وَمَعْنَا قَوْلِ الْفُقَهَاءِ رِدَّةُ الصَّبِيِّ لَا تَصِحْ And so the meaning of what the jurist said, a child's apostasy is not valid. A child's apostasy is invalid. أَنَّهُ لَوْ نَطَقَ بِالْكُفْرِ وَمَاتْ is that if he pronounced blasphemy and then died, a wahua sabi, meaning as a child, a dun al bulugh, meaning below puberty, a mata kabla an yarji anil kufur, meaning he died without retracting the blasphemy, yu amalu muamalat al muslimin, he will be treated like the Muslims. Fa yu salla alayhi wa yu ghassal wa yudfanu fi maqabiri al muslimin. And so, he will be prayed for and washed and shrouded uh, and washed and buried in Muslim cemeteries. And it's obligatory on the guardian and the likes of the guardian to forbid this child from the blasphemy and to command this child to pronounce the shahada not so that he would come back to Islam, but so that he would be accustomed to saying the shahada if something like that happened to him after puberty. Now as for the child who is below puberty, إِنْ حَصَلَ مِنْهُ فِعْلٌ كُفْرِيٌّ أَوْ اِعْتِقَادٌ كُفْرِيٌّ أَوْ قَوْلٌ كُفْرِيٌّ If a blasphemous action or a blasphemous conviction or a blasphemous word came from him. And he never believed in what was correct. Until he reached this until he reached puberty with this blasphemy. kafir, then he's a kafir at puberty. And binding on him is to say the shahada to enter into Islam after puberty. Tambih. Notice. Atiflu ladhi huwa abnu yawmihi ladhi wulida min abawayhi min abawayni kafiraini nusammihi kafira. The child that is one day old, born from two disbelieving parents, we call him a kafir. He's a kafir. This is what's correct. Yani, I find, I haven't talked to a lot of them, but people who like to say that they reverted to Islam, they don't tend in my small experience with them they don't seem to accept this that they shouldn't say that what tasmiyatuhu kafiran innama huwa bi'tibari mu'amalatihi fi dunya and naming him or designating him a kafir is merely in considering his treatment in the dunya not what his case will be in the afterlife فَيُطَبَّقُ عَلَيْهِ أَحْكَامُ الْكَافِرِينَ فِي الدُّنْيَا So the rules of the disbelievers will be applied to this child while here on earth. فَلَا يُغَسَّلْ So it's not obligatory to wash him. وَلَا يُكَفَّنْ And it's not obligatory to shroud him. The words of the shaykh here are, he's not washed and he's not shrouded. That means not obligatory. وَلَا يُدْفَنُ فِي مَقَابِرِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And he's not buried in Muslim cemeteries. That means it's not permissible. وَلَا يَرِيثُهُ أَقَارِبُهُ الْمُسْلِمُونَ And his Muslim relatives will not inherit from him. وَالَّذِي يُسَمِّيهِ مُسْلِمًا وَيَعْنِي بِهِ أَنَّهُ كَانَ يَوْمَ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ اِعْتَقَدَ التَّوْحِيبِ And the one who calls him a Muslim, and he means... That on the day of Alastu, Ertaqadat Tawheed, on that day his soul believed in monotheism. And he never stopped being like that when he was born. Inwardly, he has no harm on him in his convictions. So we're not going to call him a kafir for that. 
ومن سماه كافر حقيقة متأولا بأن بعض الأرواح مع تقدة التوحيد يوم ألست بربكم فلا نكفره And whoever calls this child a real kafir, meaning inwardly he's a kafir, having, um, yeah, misconstruing, thinking that some of the souls did not believe in monotheism on the day of Alestu, falanu kafiru. We will not deem him as a kafir. We're saying this child came from two kafir parents. وَأَمَّا مَنْ يَعْتَقَدَ أَنَّ الْأَرْوَاحَ كُلَّهَا عَتَقَدَتِ التَّوْحِيدَ يَوْمَ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ وَاسْتَمَرَّتْ عَلَى ذَلِكَ إِلَى حِينِ أَصْبَحَ طِفْلًا فَسَمَّاهُ كَافِرًا وَمُرَادُهُ حَقِيقَةً فَهَذَا يَكْفُرْ But concerning someone who believed that the souls all believed in monotheism on the day of Alestu, and they stayed like that, believing in monotheism until this one came out as a child or a baby. And then he said, this baby is a real kafir inwardly. Then this is blasphemy. فَهَذَا يَكْفُرْ This one, this is blasphemy. That's a delicate detail there. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. وَأَمَّا حَدِيثٌ كُلُّ مَوْلُودٍ يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ And as for the hadith, every child is born on the fitrah. فَأَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ And it is his parents that make him a Jew or a Christian or a Majusi. رَوَاهُ الْبُخَارِيُّ وَغَيْرُهُ that's narrated by Bukhari and others. فَمَعْنَا يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ أَيْ يَكُونُ مُسْتَعِدًّا مُتَهَيِّئًا لِقَبُولِ دِينِ الْإِسْلَامِ The meaning of the child being born on the fitrah is that he is ready and prepared for accepting Islam as a child. عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ أَيْ عَلَى فِطْرَةِ الْإِسْلَامِ He's born on the fitrah. Fitrah means khilqah, linguistically. So it means uh, how one is created. Or one's nature. It means the nature, the natural disposition. Meaning, ala fitrati al-Islam. Means that, there's still, though I want to search more about the word fitrah. Maybe with a good in-depth, not just in the dictionaries, but also the aqidah books, the hadith explanation books. And of course, verified by teachers, not by mere reading. We will see, inshallah. There's, Yani, I still, after all these years, I still think there's some nuance to the word fitrah that I haven't really gotten my finger on it. So, ala al fitrah means ala fitratil Islam. Being born on the fitrah means on the fitrah of Islam. لأنهم يولدون على مقتضعة رافهم وتوحيدهم الذي حصل يوم أخرجت الأرواح من ظهر آدم بنعمان الأراك Because they are born in accordance with their confession and their monotheism that took place on the day when the souls were extracted from the back of Adam at the place called Na'man al-Araq on earth after he came down from paradise. فَإِنَّهُمْ سُئِلُوا أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ For indeed, they were asked, Am I not your Lord? قَالُوا بَلَا لَا إِلَهَ لَنَا غَيْرُكْ They said, Indeed, we have no God but you. They all confessed to Allah's godhood. Then, when the soul enters into the body of the child, yani when the soul merges with the flesh of the fetus, it forgets this. It is said that upon the soul, 
blending with the flesh, it forgets everything. Because this is a matter, this is a spiritual matter. It's not a fleshly matter. So when the soul went into the flesh, the soul forgot all of that. This will be the child's case, the, the, the case of the child. And he remains forgetful until he hears from his parents or someone else about Islam. This doesn't mean he will remember. When the Sheikh said, until he hears, he stays forgetful until he hears. This doesn't mean he will remember, no. He will stay forgetful for the rest of his life. Nothing you can do, you will never be able to jog anyone's memory about this during his life. Until he hears from his parents or someone else about Islam. And then he will settle into what he was already upon. So it says, Yarud. Yarud. What appears from the word Ya'ud is Rujur, to go back. But the word Ya'ud could mean Yasir, to become or to be. So I'm translating it this way. He's born forgetful about this. And then if he hears from his parents or anyone else about Islam, he, and it means here the right belief in monotheism, we're not just talking about bowing and prostrating and wearing a kufi or something like that talking about monotheism then he will just settle into what he was already upon or he would hear from his parents or someone else blasphemy and then he would believe it meaning if he did believe it then he would blaspheme in reality what that means though is he would have a blasphemous conviction in reality it doesn't mean he would have a blasphemy written against him because he still didn't reach puberty but he would if he accepts that blasphemy he would then believe truly in the blasphemy but if he's born to non-muslim parents and he never heard the blasphemy then he would be a kafir in judgment, but he would not have the conviction of a kafir. This is the meaning of the hadith. It does not mean that every born one knows as soon as he's born, as soon as he exits his mother's belly, that he knows Islam in detail. For indeed, when he first comes out of his mother's belly, he doesn't know anything at all. And that's what the verse of the Quran explicitly states. That's the 78th verse of Surah Al-Nahl. Allah brings you out of the bellies of your mothers not knowing anything. That means your knowledge is zero. Zero. You don't even know your parent is. Wallahu alam. Allah knows best. We'll stop there.